Psilocybin mushrooms and salvia divinorum are two of the areas of knowledge about nature that the indigenous Mazatec people of uh, southern Mexico have. Here's a picture of Mexico. What was the old saying about Mexico? Uh, oh, Mexico, so far from God, so near to the United States. <laughs> and that makes more sense probably if you're there and you see the, the kind of burden of being the direct neighbor of the U.S. It's a very, very mountainous country. And um, one of the things about mountains, just as is true about island groups, is that they act as preservers of diversity, biodiversity, uh, speciation into very small types and subtypes and the same happens with language and with ethnicities and so people in smaller groups become isolated and tend to stay on their land for a very long time and really really know the very specific things that grow in that place and they develop language for it and songs about it ways of using the nature that they know so well and they don't tend to mix as much as in flatter areas. This is known around the world. Islands and mountains are preserved diversity. And so an outgrowth of that, in this area that I point out here on the slide is the state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, a gorgeous area. And uh, there are still 18 indigenous languages in, intact and spoken in their villages in that area. It doesn't mean these people aren't undergoing huge change. They are right now all the time. And um, as I've said in other talks, watching that change and feeling that loss and trying to just root them on in keeping, keeping their language, keeping their knowledge base, which is in their language, um, uh, alive. It's, uh, it's part of uh, my now 23, almost 24 years of working with them it has been very much a witnessing of a people undergoing change. So I'll bring us back to that point a couple of times because what we're looking at is the way they know their land and how deeply they've gotten to know these beings that live in their land, these particular uh, plant and fungal beings, as well as all the other ones, visible and invisible, that live in that land. If you've heard my other talks, you know that I really value looking back at who has known these species that we contemporary exploratory people are so enchanted with? Who has known them? And what did they find them to be? And what techniques did they develop for speaking with them, for listening to them, for healing with them, for skirting danger? Uh, how are they woven into their well-being? I guess I'm just uh, old enough to just say, I don't care what people think about that. I really feel that's really, really important. And that's where all the research has been done for a long time before we got to it. So I look at that. That's a big part of my work. And I do it by forming relationships with people who hold that worldview. This is the, the lower. You have to go way high. And then there are, it's just riddled with valleys. And so sometimes you're up at very temperate areas in you know, 15 minutes in a the back of a truck or a few hours of your hiking, you're down into subtropical and back up again. And that too, see, that's one reason that mountains create biodiversity. And so these particular people, this clan that I've worked with, uh, they live out in the country. They live in this valley that looks like this, very rumpled, very um, volcanic. It's largely been forested, not so much, a little bit for lumber, for for Mexico, uh, probably a little bit by the Spanish, even way back 500 years ago, but mostly uh, it's just people living on the land using what they need, and they have, um, they have in this area cut a lot of the trees, so a lot of it is uh, second growth, but also they are subsistence farmers, and they grow on these very steep slopes. They grow the corn and the beans. Corn or maize was, was domesticated from grasses here in this, within a couple of hundred miles of here, we know that the same corn that we all eat around the world came from uh, the, the Tehuacan Valley near here 12,000 years ago. Indian people living on the land, fiddling with grasses, figured out how to breed it up and breed it up until we got those big fat ears of corn we have now. So that's the level of attention that people have been paying to their plants for a very long time. And we have to give them a lot of uh, credit for the 
brilliant and continuous attention that it takes to be that kind of plant person, that kind of plant culture that can domesticate and change a plant that much for the benefit of people. The town that you may have heard of, Wautla de Jimenez, is the main town of this region. It's up in the mountains. And uh, it w only got a road into it in the early 1960s, and just in time for the first hippie invasion. And uh, before that, it was donkeys on tracks two or three days up from the flatter valleys uh, to get to their main town. So you can imagine that's changed a lot for a lot of different reasons. And I pass through there, everybody passes through there, but then I head out into the hills where I had the good fortune back in 1995 to meet these people. And I, I think I'll tell you the story of that in a minute. I want to give you more introduction here. And I, I have to say, this is this is the biggest piece of field work of all of the different kinds of work I've done in my life. This is the biggest piece of cultural and psychedelic field work that I've done in my life. So it's, I can talk about it for a week and we have, you know, 40 minutes or something like that. So the crops, they grow, they live in shelters and small shacks. This is the people, the family, when I met them back then, that little girl was their granddaughter and was staying with them for the summer. The elders only speak Mazatec. I speak moderately good Spanish, but um, they don't speak Spanish. Now that's one clue to that they've held on to their knowledge because as you know, living with indigenous people in this country, um, if they manage to not learn the conqueror's language or the colonizer's language, for 500 years they've been living under the Spanish and they've never spoken Spanish until this last couple of generations. And these elders, the ones I work with, still don't speak Spanish. So that means they're, they've adopted some things. They've adopted, you know, some of the saints and added it to their pantheon of beings. But they haven't taken on this whole other way of viewing, filtering, and defining reality. This little granddaughter is bilingual. So a six-year-old was my translator the first time. And, um, and I kind of semi-adopted her. And she's been uh, my goddaughter all this time. And she now has three children. And my daughter is godmother to some of them, and I'm godmother to others, and we have come and gone. Fam my family has come and gone and interwoven with their family on many, many visits. And it's just next to my own kids. It's really the, the main uh, human blessing in my life. And so I will tuck these pictures in because what we have here is a clan with that older man, Don Rutilio is his name, who is the uh, trained curandero, one who cures, or shaman, for this, for this small region where he lives. And, um, and yet people do come from farther to him. He doesn't uh, cater to outsiders. He has never um, sought that and uh, not received that. So I had to be an exception. And I want to remind us all that ethnobotany is half ethno, and ethno is people. And what do people know, and what do they carry, and what do they carry on from those around them who know something? So all of these, mostly women and children, a few men, but indigenous people all over the world are having a really hard time. And uh, so the men aren't as reliably continuous. They either are tempted away by distant work or by drink or by violence or by they're tossed into prison with no trial for a few years and made to work in a factory and then they get out again with no review. It's just uh, the life of poor indigenous people. And the, these folks are right in that category. But nevertheless, there is hope, there is humor, there is hard work. Uh, there's perennial connection between them, and I keep tucking pictures of people into my plants to say these are the knowledge holders. Even if they aren't apprentices of a shaman, they're the knowledge holders of a way of knowing and a way of being. This is the beautiful corn they grow. This is the edge of their garden, and here they plant a plant that I haven't heard. I mean, I've been told that they don't ingest or use the Brugmansias, but they regard them as powerful protectors. So if you plant that at the edge of your domain, then you're, you've buffered 
from wildness. And as in all, you know, earthy folk cultures, there are a lot of these dichotomies that are a big part of how they see things. And uh, wildness and what is tamed, the forest and the garden, the outside and the inside, the danger and safe, uh, inside and outside the vessel, these, all these uh, motifs come through daily life and they come through ceremony. And they're acknowledged and dealt with as like the structure of the invisible world. And so you really um, always remember that this is how the invisible world is operating. It's like set over us like these very tents are. And we're uh, operating within these designs and uh, flow and boundaries and all of that. And that really comes into their um, methods and their psychedelic methods as well. They love and know fungi, they're mycophilic people, and wild fungi that they collect and eat that are absolutely exquisite. Uh, in the marketplace, you'll see wild fungi being sold. They love the wild orchids that grow all through those mountains, and for reasons that are, as far as I can tell, lost in, in history, some of the orchids have ritual roles, and the bulb part of this tree orchid um, and the, this orchid smells like a very almost overpowering vanilla, but it is not the vanilla orchid. It's a much larger orchid, and uh, but they they take the starchy bulb of it, and one day a year they grind that into their tortilla flour and eat tortillas made of orchids. I haven't found out the meaning of it that yet. I, I don't ask a lot of questions. A, a preguntona is a in there in Spanish is a, a woman who asks too many questions, and you just don't want to be a person, man or woman, really, who asks too many questions. You know how we are in the underground. If somebody starts asking a whole lot of questions, you start wondering, like, you know, if you don't know them well, who who's that? What are they asking all those questions for? They're like that. They have been living in the underground for five hundred years since the Spanish came in and banned their way of doing things, banned their ceremonies, banned their deities, banned talking about it. They banned, the Spanish banned healing with herbs. To Inquisition era Spaniards, uh, that was threatening. It was all God, it was all through the priests, it was all done with offerings in a church to the priests, and the priests would mediate beyond that. And uh, maybe you could have a few saints around home you know, icons, but you couldn't talk about anything that came from your tradition or about any kind of plant medicine. And people were turning each other in under terrible pressure all over Mexico. Uh, there are vast archives of this. And because the Spanish are known as uh, papaleros or people who love paper, people who love paperwork really is what it means. <laughs> I love to write things down. There are vast archives of these trials that happened in the 16th century and even into the 17th century that have not been investigated yet. So I, I do like to point out that if someone's wondering what really obscure PhD they should um, begin to work on, the records in uh, Mexico City, they're kept underground, of the trials in the Mexican Inquisition on uh, of herbalists and shamans and who was turning them in what they they would describe their cures and then uh, They would describe them in detail and they were all written down and there's a lot of research to be done there still if you can gain access and that's you know learn Spanish and Become one of those people who lives in a basement looking at ancient papers <laughs> But it's fascinating. It's a it's a still largely hidden record so they use a number of different species, and not every, um, just as, as in other traditions of shamanism, not every healer or shaman, um, you know, shaman is a word that comes from the outside, and we put it on people in other cultures. It came from the Tungusic in uh, Siberia. So I always kind of hesitate on using that word because it's completely an outsider word, but it is a category, and we all know I think, what we mean by it. So not every person who's raised into being a, a healer or who has a crisis in their life that they survive and then are given the dream or the tools or the vision or the instruction that they must become a healer, a shaman, a person who works with these plants and mushrooms. Not every one of them will work with all of them, just like us. They'll have the one that really first did the trick 
They'll have, and they then they learn a lot about that. They'll have um, the one that their uncle taught them about. They'll have the one that um, they witnessed at their grandmother's knee when she used to heal people. And they'll have the one that comes up on the plateau above them because the other species of mushrooms you have to walk, you know, 40 miles to find. And these you only have to walk five or 10 miles to find. So people develop a, a kind of a tool kit of species that they that become their key species, usually about three different species or three species of mushrooms and a couple of species of plants. So the particular Mazatec people I work with, and, and I try not to generalize then about all of them because you could go to the next hill and find somebody else and they'd have a different tool kit. Some overlap, some different. But generally speaking, one of the categories of Mazatec uh, visionary medicine are the morning glories in the morning glory family, the convolvulaceae. It wasn't known uh, all through the late 20th century after this use was discovered just before World War II and, and then in the 1950s, uh, you know, in much more detail. It wasn't known how this family, the convolvulaceae, that is not usually psychoactive, could be producing the kind of alkaloids that are LSD-like to cause these, these visions. And that was a mystery for a very long time until just the past decade at the most when it was discovered that, well, the whole notion of endophytes has been, has been discovered and now is being studied. And endophyte, phyte means plant, endo means inside. Endophytes are, are very tiny mycelial formed fungi that live inside between the cells of plants. And, uh, they have a different chemistry and metabolism and create metabolic products, alkaloids, the things that we all love, that's what changes our brains. The endophytes create uh, alkaloids that the plant is unable to, to create. So th that explains finally why the only place in the morning glories that you find psychoactivity, not in the stem, not in the root, not in the leaves, it's in the seeds because they have this invisible little bit of fungus that's creating an ergot-like compound uh, that's LSD-related in the seeds. And that's just so interesting to me in another field where, um, you know, you could, you could go study, go a long ways with that one. And they use two species of morning glories. This is the other, and actually more famous, uh, Ipomia violacea, which normally, if we grow it as a garden plant, uh, looks like uh, the funnel-shaped flower of a morning glory that you know, a larger funnel than the last species I showed you. But the people that I have talked with there say they only use this mutated form, where the petals have split into this kind of fringe, and it doesn't even look like a morning glory, except if you know your plants, you can see by the leaves and the seed pods and all of that, that of course it is. So it's a mutation. There are three different varieties and three different colors, and it's the seeds, again, that are used. They're used pretty much interchangeably, Rivea corimbosa and Ipomea violacea, um, maybe sometimes even together, but you dose them differently. So Probably not, but they both have this same uh, ergot alkaloid in the, as an endophyte in the seeds. And this plant, the seeds are ground, a little uh, Coke bottle cap size is how they measure it, and then that's ground fine and put in a little bit of water and drunk. And then the way I've been told, I have not done this one, is that you lie down and go to sleep with your question, and you've got somebody, your guide or your, your, the one who's administering it with you, maybe napping alongside you, and you go to sleep with your question, like, where did my, my best burro disappeared? Is there any way, which mountain do we look over to find him? Or did someone steal him and take him far away? Or is he dead? Or you say, uh, my son left saying he was going to go find work in El Otro Lado, the other side. The other side means the United States. And, uh, and there's no communication. Is he doing OK? And then you go into this dream state with this. And, um, and when you, and you wake up after just a few hours with a dream, and you, you tell it to the, to the um, practitioner who's administering this, and he or she interprets your dream. And you find out, oh, your son is living in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's got a job. And you have a grandchild, and he's doing fine. Or, I can't find him anywhere, I'm really sorry, I don't know if he's still alive. Or, you know, your sister-in-law 
had somebody steal the donkey because she's always really wanted it and she's hiding it, you know, or <laughs> that kind of thing. So there are many levels of this visionary investigation, and some of them are very utilitarian, like that. Of course, they use all of these different species of mushrooms, which you probably know all, uh, many psilocybe species. The highest concentration of them, of species that we know of, is right in this same area. And everyone is seen as a different person, a different entity that has its own name and its character, and it's good for different kinds of things. It's interesting when you have that many choices of a certain class of psychedelic, then they say, well, let's figure out which one is best at dealing with, you know, sudden crisis like snake bite or with long, slow period of eroding bad luck. That's a common thing that is treated or... Um, helping to make peace in a family that's been, you know, kind of battling for a long time or blessing a field that is going to be uh, plowed and this family is totally depending on, on it this year or calling in the rain. All the different reasons that they'll have ceremony and some species are perceived to be more efficacious at getting certain results than others or at taking you to the level that you need to be at to have an influence in supplicating the universe to respond in the way that you're hoping for. It's very much about prayer. And when I use the word prayer, I want to be clear because some people have an aversion to the word prayer or they think of it as, you know, a religious or a Christian or something. Um, but it's, a, it's really a conversation with the invisible about what you're grateful for and what you're asking for and what you're listening for that you don't know about and you need to learn. It's a way, it's a word that is widely used, and they use several words for it, but uh, to, to mean going into conversation with the invisible, basically. This is Psilocybe Serolescens, which is called De Rumbes, uh, which means uh, landslide or upheaval. And it does grow where um, a slope has collapsed or where uh, there is, uh, even sometimes if a new road has been built off the side of the road in disrupted soil, this very hardy, big, bold Psilocybe comes up and it has this kind of boldness in the experience of it too. It's like a horse, you know, it's like a strong presence, not just strong dose of psilocybin. I think we tend to think in terms of like quantities of chemicals, but they're talking in spiritual terms, you know, and then there is the chemical profile of each of these as well, pharmacological profile. This is from that wonderful old book that was available for about a minute back in 1976, The Little Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants, and then the publisher I guess they had a wayward nephew or something who managed to get this one out, and then the publisher pulled it back, and they deny ever, ever having published it. If you have a copy, you're very lucky. But these are some of the species of psilocybes from this area of the Mazatecs, and their neighboring Chinantec, Quicatec, Zapotec, they use some of these, but they all agree that the Mazatecs are the ones that know the most. And there's a long tradition that we see of, of reverence for these. And these, these mushroom stones, which are about two feet tall, are found in archaeology sites all over southern tropical Mexico and into Guatemala. So we know that at some time in the past, there was a more official relationship with those who built the, you know, monuments and the temples and things like that, because they found these in association with those. But the people who live there now, like the Maya and others, um, don't seem to have a use of them. Beautiful, beautiful children. These are all adults now, and some of them have children. Just to talk about, like, the blend of worldviews that these people have been going through. So the Spanish came in. The Aztecs had come just before them, so like in late 1300s, the Aztecs, 1400s, the Aztecs were reaching out across all of central Mexico, conquering all sorts of people. It was the first uh, really big empire that did that and creating trade that meant all these tribal groups had to send their best, whatever they made or grew, they had to send it back to Mexico City for the courts and for the armies and all of that, so a tribute system. And these people, the Mazadec people, I 
it seems, <clears throat> I mean, it's a hidden history, but it seems that they began to shrink even deeper into the hills and to keep their knowledge a little closer, even under the Aztecs. And then they were only there like 150 years, and then the Spanish arrived, and it was all laid out for them, and they, you know, I'm shortening up the story, but they really just moved right into the avenues the Aztecs had created. And they then uh, inter commanded certain things and then laid out other things. And they one thing that the Mazatecs and other people, indigenous people across Mexico could accept is, is the idea that there are many beings who are kind of helpers to whatever the biggest deities are. And the Spanish Catholics called them saints. And the Mazatecs had earth spirits and ancestral spirits and water spirits and, and uh, all sorts of levels of beings that they were interrelated with. And they, they said, oh, OK, well, that, you know, we're into a pantheon. The more, the better. We need lots of help. And we can remember everybody's name and relationships. So we'll take on some of those saints and we'll add them. Or if they wanted to talk about their own deities, which was forbidden, they called them by the names of the saints' deities. And then the Spanish Catholics thought they were talking about Catholic deities, but the Mazatecs were actually talking about their own ancient ones. And this is documented as having happened in much of indigenous Mexico at that time, variations on that. So it's um, one reason that you get so many plants in Mexico and even in other parts of Latin America that refer to Mary or Maria or the La Virgencita, the Little Virgin or the Virgin Mother or the, you know, all these variations on the great feminine as she comes through these species. And um, I think it's important to remember that there are these layers of identification that are really looking at the qualitative essence of these species. And it's not just that everybody suddenly gave up everything they'd always believed, became Catholic, and named everything after um, you know, the, the Virgin, but also, um, also the Virgin Guadalupe was a vision that came to an Indian man as the Mother Mary that had been brought from Europe, the concept. Uh, a dark-skinned mother goddess appeared after the Spanish came, and she said, I'll be your protectors, you poor people of the earth, and uh, you know me. You already know me. I am the earth, and I will be your protector. And to this day, the Virgin of Guadalupe, or just La Guadalupe, people call her, um, is, uh, she just brings so much solace to people. And and I, it's a long topic, so I won't go farther, but I, I just I think it's misinterpreted as everyone is a devout Catholic. I think it's actually um, deeper, older, and uh, more layered than that. And and re and it helps explain why so many of these plants have reference to Mary. And we'll see which ones do. And by the way, that was uh, that offering is cacao beans on the left there, chocolate beans, just out on a trail at a spot that looked to me like just another place on the trail to them. It's got some special energy, and you need to make an offering whenever you pass it, and those kind of places are all along. It's all foot trails all over those mountains, and there are lots of places to leave offerings, and they create a little cavern to put the candle in, and they put fresh flowers or beans down, and it might be because... Uh, you know, a spring wells up near there. It might be because something happened there once. It's still in the stories. Um, and then you might get to a mountaintop and find, you know, these these plants. These are Galtheria species that they bring as offerings and, uh, and a picture of the Virgin Mary there at the top of the mountain. Um, uh, you've probably heard of Maria Sabina because she was the Indian healer who became world known in the 1950s when R. Gordon Wasson and Valentina Wasson went down to Mexico to investigate mushrooms and went up to these people and then widely publicized their mushroom experiences. Everyone that I know there, the Mazda people, call her poor little Maria because she got trapped in the limelight and she just thought she was giving some strange outsiders mushrooms and she, she got eaten up by it, you know, and destroyed by it. And then everything did begin to change socially and economically in that region. Now, whether or not the mushroom itself changed or the mushrooms, the, the essence changed, has been a topic of discussion. And that's where we come in. We're part of that change. This is a 
very underground mushroom deal that I witnessed in 1995 <laughs> between these nefarious characters. One nice mom who sells tortillas and forages for psilocybin mushrooms in pink, and the other one a midwife who was coming to get them because besides delivering babies, she does mushroom ceremonies, or did then. Actually, they weren't being really hidden about it. And uh, I, I said to them, because the door was open and there were people passing by in the village on the street, and I said, don't you have to hide what you're doing? And they said, well, it's not marijuana. <laughs> about psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> that was their perspective. <laughs> And the classic cubensis that we all know, you know, that swept over the world beginning in 1975 came from here, although we also know that it grows here, it grows in many parts of the world. It is a traveling mushroom. This is a mushroom that has been getting around for a long time, partly because it follows cows around, right? And so it's in their poop and they and then it gets going wherever they go and the Europeans brought cattle and cattle moved around Asia and the mushroom just keeps on riding along, which means if it's around cattle, it's near to people, it's not a wilderness mushroom, you know. And so it's been tagging along and whispering to us probably for a very long time, even if people weren't taking it. And now, and it's one of the many mushrooms they use. The people I work with, the clan that I work with, uh, it is not their favorite mushroom. It's a, it's a good, useful mushroom. Uh, for experience. But if, if they can find one of the ones that they prefer for ceremony, they'll use the others. This is sort of number three. And yet it's sort of a, you know, it's like for utilitarian tripping. <laughs> when you have certain things, you need to get into that state because you have certain things to do and it will do the job, you know. Um, they call it San Isidro. San Isidro is the saint of workers, of hard workers, masons and ditch diggers and people like that, road builders. It means this mushroom is very useful if you have a big job to do. So I've always reflected on how, well, there was this big job to do. It needed to go out. And I mean, we'd all been indoctrinated from the 60s to LSD, but we didn't have a, a psychedelic that we knew how to grow that didn't go through a laboratory process that you could do on a small scale in your kitchen or in your garden that we could hand between each other that was organic and we now had that idea of organic going and cubensis came along and whoosh it was just very present and everybody was growing it and it was a uh, different than LSD and and um, if you were around in, in the late 70s when it really just like a tidal wave swept out into everyone's closets and kitchens and all of that, um, and concerts, uh, then, then you remember that, oh, there's a new wave coming through, you know, there's a new kind of vibe in the psychedelic experience that we have not to replace LSD, but to give another alternative and to be another another way. Different things can be learned with this one. Different things can be enjoyed. And so I really nod to it as, um, as a pioneer mushroom, sort of, you know, that has gone out and done the hard work of tilling the fields of all of these other populations in the world. One of their favorites is a little tiny, quick to decay mushroom, uh, Psilocybe mexicana. This is a dark photo, but there's just a ton of mushrooms on that giant leaf on that altar. And they'd go out and collect them. And if they find mushrooms, especially with climate change now, they're not that reliable. You can only do a mushroom when you f ceremony when you find them. And, and these people have still haven't got refrigeration. And it's too moist to dry things. They don't have any tradition of drying mushrooms. So the day you find the mushrooms, you do a ceremony. And if you have someone who's plagued by some problem, who's been asking you for weeks, could we do a mushroom ceremony to help me or to help my husband get better or to set our, uh, you know, the chain of our luck back in, in order, whatever, then you, you send a messenger off to that family and you say, okay, tonight, tonight, drop everything. Tonight's the night we're doing a ceremony. We found the mushrooms. And, um, and that's a whole different way of preparing for, you know, what might be a really intense, transformative experience um, than the way that many of us do it. And this, uh, they measure everything in pairs. Um, and I think that's quite widespread among the Mazatecs. Uh, the pair 
everything's symbolic. Everything's layered and symbolic. So masculine and feminine is reflected in every pair. And anything that has to do with medicine, any kind of herbal medicine, any kind of good luck medicine, amulets, all kinds of things, has to reflect the masculine and feminine. So the, they say, well, you'll be taking, you know, 14 pairs of this mushroom or salvia divinorum, which we're going to talk about. You'll be taking 37 pairs of leaves. And that's just how things are counted. And you, you don't talk about it in another way and translate it. You talk about it in pairs. So that night that we found these mushrooms, three of us each, he, his son, and me, we each took uh, 37 pairs. There seems to be a lot of questions about salvia. And, uh, and we call it salvia, but of course there are many other salvia species, so know that, you know. So it really is salvia divinorum, the so-called divine sage or the divining sage, the sage for looking into things and telling what will happen. That's the Latin name that was given to it based on what was known about its traditional uses. The being is called la pastora. La pastora is uh, Spanish, and it refers to, literally refers to a shepherdess or to a big female entity that guides and protects pastoral care even if you have any background in Catholicism is taking care of the flock seeing what they need serving serving people and um, so she's called la pastora or shka pastora shka means leaf in uh, Mazatec leaves of the shepherdess is a word that has come uh, an English term that we've applied to these leaves in the mint family she flowers in this way, and yet it's quite spectacular, tall spikes with kind of furry, velvety, pale lavender corollas, and just a, a beautiful, beautiful plant, really loves moisture, indirect light, um, good humidity, and, um, and to be hidden. And this is one thing, I, one reason I think the Mazatecs love her is that they are essentially a hidden people. And Mazatec, the name even comes, it's a reference to deer. And uh, the deer, they say, are very shy and just come to the edge and look in. And if they're startled, they run back out and, in, you know, back away. And uh, they're people like that. They're, they're kind of closed and um, probably for lots of historical reasons where they were keeping this knowledge secret for so long, uh, for 500 years of keeping all of this hidden, and maybe even before. I mean, what brought them to those hills? There are theories about that, but they migrated, you know, a couple thousand years ago from another part of Mexico and became more private. So this plant represents that same uh, reluctance to be in the noise, in the light, in the fray, um, and they grow, they have wonderful gardens and fields of all kinds of plants. They're scattered, each family has different fields scattered in different parts of the mountains. So you have various kinds of soils and light aspects and all of these things. So you can grow a variety of things. But, um, but they grow those who, the only people who would grow salvia divinorum are people who practice with it, people who heal or who guide others. And they would not grow it in their garden or near their home or near a path. They would grow it out in groves of woods where they know where it is and hopefully others don't. If someone hunting or whatever comes upon a patch of salvia divinorum, they know that it's really bad karma to mix cultural terms. Uh, to mess with someone else's patch, that that is very private. You shouldn't really even look at it. You shouldn't, shouldn't touch it. You certainly shouldn't take any of it. When I went down there, I had a, a persistent heart problem that I had been told I should get on medication, but then I'd have to take it for the rest of my life. And I'd had a lot of heartbreaking crises in my life in the few preceding years, and, you know, was a single mom and a bunch of different um, pressures. And I, um, and I thought, well, first I'm going to go to the kind of people who know how to heal, and then I'm going to ask if we can do something about my condition before I go this other route. And I, uh, and I got a wonderful, you know, blessing of an introduction from a 
anthropologist outdoorsman who once had roamed through these hills and met this family, this very private family out in the boondocks. And, uh, and he said, I've never told anyone where they are, but I trust you to not blow it with them and also that you really do need help and I, they're the people I would recommend. So here's how you find them. And it was quite a saga finding them and I had to find a Mazatec person to help me. It's just trails out in the mountains. Uh, find them, and, and then they wouldn't talk to me because I had a Mazatec man with me that they didn't know, and so they just said, but but I said, but I know Roberto, their friend, and they said, okay, then ditch that other Mazatec guy and come back, and that meant like huge trip back out and then coming back on my own, which I did, and then we got to know each other and began, they began by interviewing me about my personal history. They were clearly considering whether or not they were willing to do a ceremony with me, but they wanted to know my story from the beginning. They wanted to know, you know, if my parents were alive and if anyone had died in my family, how they died and what had happened to me that might be trauma and all of these things. And then they agreed to do a ceremony with me. He agreed, Don Rutilio. And um, and they said, but we don't have, it was mushroom season, but w it, things were erratic. And he said, we don't have mushrooms that we can find right now. We might encounter some next week, but we only can do mushroom ceremonies when the mushrooms show up, which they believe the mushrooms show up when lightning strikes the ground in a certain place and shoots that lightning bolt of knowledge into the earth and then the mushrooms arise there soon after. So you're taking the lightning when you take the mushroom. But I said, well, I've grown salvia divinorum in my garden, in my, you know, protected place for 17 years. And I know that you know about it and I've never eaten it. And um, do you have that? Could we do a ceremony with that? And they s were very surprised that I knew about it. And that I, the only Mazatec word I knew was shka, leaf, but that managed to impress them. And, <laughs> and they said, uh, you know, we'll think about it. And then they, they did go to their grove. And I wasn't invited for, for uh, two or three visits. I wasn't invited to go see where the little, the salvia patch was in the grove. But, um, but they came back with the leaves and we did a ceremony where uh, the way they do it, because they say that there's a, a factor where, and I, I wonder if any of you have experienced this, where uh, sometimes, because it's disassociative, you know, sometimes a person w who's overwhelmed by the experience will separate in a way from their body awareness and not see where they are, but they'll start moving and they're strong and they just get on their feet and they start moving out the door, up the mountain, down the mountain, out into the snow, wherever you happen to be, some people move. And from what I've heard over the years, I'd say it's about one in 10 this happens to. So they, one person at a time does this. They were sitting at an altar, which is just their rough table that you saw there, you know, with a few flowers and candles and pile of hand-grown, hand-ground, homegrown tobacco on it. And, uh, and they sit almost knees to mine, like right on either side. We're in little tiny wooden chairs. Don Rutilio, his adult son, guarding me while I eat the leaves. And they roll the leaves up. 37 pairs of hand-sized leaves. That is a really big salad, and it's really bitter. And roll those up into a, like a long cigar, and then, uh, and they told me all these instructions. And then I start eating, eating, eating through this, through this wad. And um, and they said before you're done with it, it will come on, and uh, you'll be. Um, almost overwhelmed, but continue to eat it. Just continue to eat it and to swallow it. And then just just pray, just pray out loud if you can, but if you can't, just in any language, she understands any language, just keep in communication, you know? And so I, I did that. And just before the end of eating that wad, it just went poof, just different reality replaced this one. And I, um, and I found myself in a beautiful, really big garden, and in the distance on the other side of that garden, which the garden was surrounded, ironically, by a little white picket fence, and all kinds of flowers grew within, and all kinds of bees and butterflies, and there was deep, dark forest right on the outside. But on the far side of the garden was this huge, diaphanous woman, like 20-some feet tall, and I could see through her, and she was 
gardening and she was moving through the garden. It seemed like it took such a long time and I just loved watching her though. But I started to develop the desire that she come to me and that she come, that she come touch me. And, um, and I, I just started really putting that out silently into the garden. And that's all I knew. I wasn't aware of anything else. Except after a while, I did kind of wonder why I couldn't walk to her. And then I sort of looked down and realized I was a plant on the far edge of the garden. And so were the family that were there with me. We were all plants silently waiting, hoping and praying that she'd come with her huge, beautiful hands and just touch us. And eventually she wandered through the garden and all the way over and just waved her hands right through our bodies. And, uh, and, uh, a little door, a little filigree door opened up in my heart and um, it blew open like a little sudden breeze had come. It just blew open and I just saw this hurt just fly out and dissolve and, um, and my heart was, was better. I never had another problem with it. And, um, and so it was like <laughs> it was it was a miracle <laughs> to me of healing, but also it was just such an exquisitely beautiful vision and so literal, you know. And then, um, and then I came out of the state pretty soon, and everything we were quiet. And then we talked about it a little bit, and then we all went to bed, and then we talked a little bit the next day. And um, and I had comported myself well, and I had followed their instructions, and I had been healed, and so then I was taken in. And, and so then the next, you know, 20-some years has, has happened where we've learned many things together. I know that was longer than I was supposed to go, so I'm going to stop. And I'm sorry I can't take questions, but I want to share with you that essence of the Salvia experience because so many people have been asking about it. Thank you. <laughs>